Chapter 5. What mortification is not. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Philippians 3 verse 12. So far we have established the following in general, that it is the duty of men to be killing sin by the Spirit. Romans 8 13. Dead men must make killing sin their daily work all their days. That the Spirit is the only means through which men are able to kill any one sin. And that our life, vigor, and comfort depend on our killing sin. But now we move on to consider some practical cases in our study of mortification of sin in believers. Suppose a man to be a true Christian, but is dealing with a powerful sin. It troubles and perplexes him. Why do I keep doing this? Am I really saved, he thinks. It weakens his ability and desire to really connect with God. He feels no peace in his heart and feels dirty in his conscience. He worries about the fact that he does not feel as bad about it as he believes he should. What should he do? What can such a man do in order to kill his sin? His lust and his corruption, such that though it might not be destroyed perfectly, he is at least able to maintain strength, peace, communion with God as he fights it. To answer these questions over the course of the rest of this book, I will show what it is to kill any sin, both negatively and then positively in the next chapter. Give general directions for killing sin without which it will be utterly impossible for anyone to truly kill any one sin. Chapter 7 and 8 and draw out the particulars of killing sin for how this is to be done. Chapters 9 to 13. Keep in mind that these considerations are meant to be practical and helpful in nature, and are not meant to be understood as a doctrine of mortification in general. Mortification is not the utter destruction and death of sin. To mortify a sin is not utterly to kill, root it up, or destroy it so that it has no foothold or home in our hearts. This is surely what we are aiming at, but we will not accomplish it in this life. No one truly sets himself to kill sin without aiming at, intending, and desiring its utter destruction, that it shall no longer have either root or fruit in his heart. He wants to kill it fully, so that it will never move, never call, never seduce or tempt him ever again. He aims at its non-existence, even though by the spirit and grace of Christ a man might experience success in his fight against sin. He should still not expect it to be utterly destroyed in this life. Paul assures us of this, saying, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect. Philippians 3.12 He was a model saint, a pattern for believers. He had no equal in the world with regard to faith, love, and all the fruits of the Spirit, and even calls himself mature in comparison to others. Yet he still says he was not perfect, but was pressing on, verse 12. We, like Paul, still have a corrupt body that must be changed by the great power of Christ at last. Verse 21. We certainly want perfection, but God has determined that it is best for us that we should not be complete in ourselves, but that in all things we must be complete in Christ, which is best for us. Colossians 2 verse 10 Mortification is not merely to stop the outward practice of sin. It is obvious that sin is not necessarily mortified in a man when he outwardly appears to have stopped practicing a certain sin. When this happens, and a man is able to stop the practice of any sin in outward ways. Others might view him as a changed man. God knows that such a man has simply added hypocrisy to his former sin, and is now in a more sure path toward hell than he was before if he continues in this deceit. Instead of having a more holy heart for his forsaken of sin, he just has a more cunning heart. Mortification does not simply become a quiet, calm person. The mortification of sin does not consist in simply becoming more quiet or calm in your temperament. The reality of life and sin 
is that no two men have the exact same natural tendencies and disposition. One man may be naturally predisposed to strong expressions of anger and passion, whereas another does not struggle much at all with those things. If the latter man were to cultivate his own natural disposition with discipline, consideration, and wisdom, he might seem to some to be very advanced in a practice of mortification when in reality his heart is actually a standing cesspool of untouched sin, while the first, naturally angry man has actually done more toward mortification than he. Men should not seek to measure their progress in killing sin by the sort of things that are never sin issues towards which they are naturally inclined. If this mortified-looking man were to judge himself by some other sin such as self-indulgence, unbelief, and envy, or some other sin, he would have a better view of himself. Mortification of sin is not the diversion of sin towards some other sin. A sin that is only diverted has not truly been killed or mortified. In the book of Acts, Simon the sorcerer repented of a sorcery, that he had earned him a great reputation. But later on, his covetousness and ambition were revealed another way in his desire for the power to bestow the Holy Spirit. Even though Simon had professed Christ and outwardly repented of his sins, the underlying root of his sin, love of power and reputation, had not yet been killed. So though he gave up practicing magic, he lusted after the power the apostles had to grant the Holy Spirit to others. Acts 8 verses 18 and 19 his old sin now put forth itself a different way. A man may be aware of a sinful desire, work hard to not give in to it, take care not to commit it frequently as it has before, and yet that man might still find the same sinful habit to come out in some other way. It is like a man who has a sore, who when it heals and skins over thinks he is cured, yet because it is infected beneath the skin, it soon festers and opens up again in a different place. A sin might become diverted for various reasons that have nothing to do with the gracious work of God, or change in a man's routines, relations, interests, plans, and so on. Yet grace might also have had nothing to do with bringing it about. For example, old men do not usually continue pursuing youthful desires, such as sex, drugs, or alcohol, wild party, and their popularity, yet may have never mortified any one of them. The same is true of trading sinful desires, quitting one in order to serve another. A man who exchanges pride for worldliness, physical pleasures for rule-keeping like a Pharisee, or vanity in himself for contempt of others, should not think that he has killed the sin he seems to have left. He has changed his master, but as a servant still, mortification is not just occasional victories over sin. Sin is not necessarily killed when you enjoy occasional victories over it. There are too many occasions upon which a man who is fighting a particular sin may think he has killed it. 1. Deep Conviction and embarrassment over willful sin. Sometimes when a man yields to temptation and commits a sin willfully, it disturbs his peace, convicts his conscience, causes him to fear embarrassment of scandal, and convinces him he has surely provoked God. When this happens, a man wakes up to the ugliness of sin. This recognition brings him to hate his sin and himself for committing it. It sends him to God makes him cry out as if to plea for his life, to hate his lust, as he hates hell, and to set himself against it. Then since the whole man, both spiritual and natural, is awakened, sin shrinks back, it hides, and it appears to be dead. It is like when an assassin sneaks into an army and kills a high-ranking officer. Immediately the guards are awake and alert carefully searching for the assassin, who in the meantime hides himself or plays dead, yet fully intending to strike again when given the opportunity. 
For example, the Corinthians mustered up themselves as way for the surprise and destruction of sin. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 11. It is the same way in a person when his conscience, peace, or credit is stricken in some eruption of actual sin. He rises up carefully with indignation, desire, fear, and revenge, setting all his faculties to work against that sin, and then his sinful desires are quiet for a season, being run down by his efforts. But when the hurry is over, and the investigation is pat, the thief appears again alive, and as busy as ever at his work. Number two, desire to flee from judgment or affliction. Other times, during a period of judgment, calamity, or pressing affliction, his heart becomes set on thoughts and efforts to flee from the present troubles, fears, and dangers. Though he concludes that this fleeing is only done by letting go of sin, which gains peace with God. It is the anger of God in every affliction that torments a convinced person. To be freed of this, men renounce their sins at such times. They determine that sin will never again have any place in their hearts. They will never again give up themselves to the service of it. Then, of course, sin is quiet. It makes no movements and seems to be dead, not because it has actually been wounded at all, but merely because the soul is awake, aware and ready to fight against sinful temptations. But soon the soul settles back down and goes back to sleep and sin once again returns to its previous activity level. Consider those the psalmist speaks of. In spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. So he made their days vanish like a breath, and their years in terror. When he killed them, they sought him. They repented and sought God earnestly. They remembered that God was a rock the Most High God, their Redeemer. But they flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Psalm 78, verses 32 to 37. I do not doubt that when they repented and sought God earnestly, that they did so wholeheartedly intending to relinquish their sins. That is what is expressed in the word repented. To repent to return to the Lord is only done by letting go of and turning away from sin. And they did so earnestly. Yet their sin was still unmortified despite of all this. Verses 36 and 37. This is the state of many people who are humbled by their afflictions. And in this way many are deceived believing that they have done away with sin when they have only let go of it because of the pain of their afflictions. These are just a few of the ways that poor souls deceive themselves and suppose they have killed their sin. In reality, it is alive and well. It comes back frequently to their disturbance and unrest. Chapter 6 What Mortification Is those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 5.24 Mortification is a habitual weakening of sin. Every sinful desire is a depraved habit or disposition, continually inclining the heart toward evil. This is how the Bible describes a man who has not truly killed any sinful desire. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart is only evil continually. Genesis 6 verse 5 He is always powerfully inclined or bent towards sin. And the only reason he does not continually pursue one particular sinful desire day and night is because he has many to serve, each one crying out to be satisfied. So he is distracted by various desires but is nevertheless generally inclined towards self-satisfaction. So then, we will consider the sinful desire that we wish to kill to be a strong, deeply rooted habit. It powerfully bends the will and affections toward acting out that sin. This is what it means that men have their hearts set to do evil. 
your spirit is inclined toward evil, to make provision for the flesh. Romans 13 verse 14 Sinful, depraved habits are distinguished from moral good habits, whereas good habits gently incline the soul toward engaging in them. Sinful habits violently urge or compel the soul forward. This is why Peter warns that sinful desires wage war against the soul. 1 Peter 2 verse 11 They rebel and fight against the believer's desires to do what is right with all the opposition and violence typical of acts of war. Romans 7 verse 23 They take the soul captive when they succeed in battle. These are all violent, vehement actions. From the description we have in it in Romans 7, I could demonstrate fully his tendency to blind the conscience, make the heart unresponsive to convictions, ignore reason, interrupt the power and influence of any thoughts that might hold it back, and break through all resistance into a flame. But that is not my present purpose. The first aspect of truly killing sin is weakening the habit of sin so that it cannot rise up, agitate, provoke, or entice with the same violence, intensity, or frequency as it naturally is able to do. James 1, 14 and 15 When caution I would urge readers to remember is that every sinful desire by nature equally and universally inclines one to sin with these two caveats. 1. One sinful desire may be stronger or more powerful than another sinful desire. Likewise, the same sinful desire may be stronger in one man than in another man. Sometimes one sinful desire hits a man harder than another man, or harder than a different sinful desire does. This might be due to natural tendencies in him, frequent opportunities to be tempted, or simply because Satan has a grip on the man with which to manipulate him. When this happens, even though he still knows the truth, the sinful desire darkens his mind as with a mist, and its corrupt affections and passions are thus set free to wreak havoc. But more so, sinful desires get strength from temptation when the right temptation is combined with a sinful desire, it gives it new life, vigor, power, violence, and rage, which it did not seem to have before. Number two, some sinful desires are easier to detect than others. Paul describes the difference between sexual sin and all other sins. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 He means the activities of that sin are easier to feel and see than others. For example, the love of the world or the like might be just as habitual and widespread in the same person, Yet it does not have the same destructive consequences. And because of this reality, some men may see themselves, and even be seen in the eyes of the world, as men who have killed their sin. Yet these men are just as filled with sinful desires and others who are astonished and troubled by the reality of their sins, or even those who have been hurried by the power of their sinful desires into scandalous sins. These men simply have sinful desires that are in and about things that do not bother them in their souls. They do not get worked up about them because they are more concerned with other things. Therefore, the first thing in mortification is a weakening of this habit so that it will not compel and upset the soul as it has done so far. It must be weakened so that it will not entice and draw you aside. It must be weakened so that it will not be able to disrupt your efforts to strangle its life, strength, and determination to tempt you. This is called crucifying the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 5 verse 24 That is, taking away the life, blood, and morale of the flesh to give it strength and power 
to waste in the way of the body of death day by day. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16 When a man commits to this, his flesh is like a man nailed to the cross. It first struggles and strives and cries out with great strength and might. But, as its lifeblood and will wastes away, its strivings become more faint and infrequent. It moans, become quiet and hoarse, hardly making any noise. When a man first determines to deal with a sinful desire, it struggles violently to break free. It screams earnestly and impatiently to be satisfied and relieved. But when, through mortification, its blood and will are drained, it moves infrequently and faintly, cries sparingly, and grows barely audible to the heart. It might occasionally have a dying surge that puts on a show appearing to display great power and strength, but it is over quickly especially if it is kept from succeeding. This is what the Apostle Paul describes in Romans 6, verse 6. Here he says, Son is crucified. It is nailed to the cross. To what end? That the body of death may be brought to nothing, to power of sin weaken bit by bit, so that we should no longer be enslaved to sin. That is, in order that sin might not incline and compel us to effectively make us slaves to it, it has done up until now. Paul is not only speaking of physical pleasures or desires of worldly things. No, he is saying that the whole flesh, the mind and will that oppose God by nature, must be weakened and killed. Whatever the root or nature of the sin is, However, it might reveal itself, either by encouraging evil or hindering from good. The rule is the same. Sin must be starved and weakened unless it's done effectively. Any other fighting or striving against sin will not work. A man may beat down the bitter fruit from an evil tree until he is tired, but while the root is still alive, Beating down the present fruit will not keep it from producing more fruit. This is a mistake some men make. They set up themselves earnestly and diligently against the visible eruption of sinful desire. But since they leave the root of it untouched, and perhaps not even understood, they make little or no progress toward killing their sin. Mortification is also not the constant fighting against sin. It is a step of solid progress in mortification to always be putting pressure on sin. When sin is strong and lively, the soul is hardly able to gain any ground against it. The soul sighs and groans and mourns and is troubled, but it rarely has sin on the run. David complains that the sin had overtaken him so that he cannot see Psalm 40, verse 12. A little was he able to fight against it. Now, several things are necessary for fighting against sin. Number one, recognize, notice, and regard sin as an enemy that must be destroyed. You must recognize that sin is an enemy that must be dealt with. Learn to take notice of it and regard it as an enemy indeed and one that must be destroyed by all possible means. As I said before, this fight is taxing and hazardous. It is about the things of eternity. Therefore, when men take their sin lightly, one cannot conclude that they are making progress in killing sin. Every man must know the plague of his own heart. 1 Kings 8 verse 38 Or no other work can be done in him. It is frightening that many men have so little knowledge of the main enemy that they carry around with them in their hearts. This makes them eager to justify themselves and to resist correction or warning regarding their sin because they do not believe that they are in any danger. Second Chronicles 16 verse 10 Number 2. Know how sin usually wins. To begin this fight, 
You must work to be familiar with the ways, tricks, methods, advantages, and opportunities that grant sin success. This is how men deal with their enemies. They learn how they think, figure out their objectives, and consider how they have won in the past so that they can stop them. This requires great skill. Take this away, and all waging a war, through which we have gained the most in human wisdom and zeal, would be mindless. Likewise, this is how those who kill their sin deal with their sinful desires, and they do so not only when sin is actually troubling, enticing, and seducing, but when they are at rest, they consider, this is our enemy, this is how he works, and the direction he is going, and these are his advantages. This is how he has won before, and this is what he would do if he would not stop him. Likewise, David considered, My sin is ever before me. Psalm 51, 3 And, indeed, one of the most important aspects of useful spiritual wisdom is in discovering the subtleties, policies, and depths of any indwelling sin. We want to consider and know what its greater strength is. What advantage does it use to capitalize on certain occasions, opportunities, and temptations? What pleas, pretenses, and excuses does it make? What strategies and embellishments does it make in order to hide the truth from us? Such wisdom helps us to set the wisdom of the spirit against the craft of the old man to trace a serpent and all of its turnings and windings, to be able to say it is most secret and imperceptible actings. This is your old way in course. I know what you aim at. This kind of readiness is a good part of our warfare. Number three, use every weapon at your disposal. As a most important aspect of the battle, you must attack your sin daily with all the things at your disposal for killing and destroying it. One who fights this way never thinks his sinful desire is dead because it is quiet but continues to work to give it new wounds, striking it at every day. Colossians 3, 5 Now while the soul is at work in this condition and dealing with sin in this way, it has the upper hand, and sin is dying under the sword. Mortification consists in frequent success. Frequent success against any sin is another part and evidence of mortification. By success, I do not mean merely refraining from doing it, so that it does not win when temptation comes, but victory over it, in pursuit of it until it is completely conquered. For example, whenever your heart detects sin at work, seducing you, forming fantasies about how good it would be so that you feel inclined to make provisions for the flesh to fulfill its desires, the heart instantly sees a sin and brings it to the law of God and love of Christ, condemns it and fully executes it. It is a good sign when a man begins to treat his sin like this, so that sinful desire is weakened in the root and foundation, and its movements and actions are fewer and weaker than they were before, so that they are not able to keep him from his duty or interrupt his peace when he can quietly and calmly identify and fight against sin and have success against it then sin is considerably slain, and despite its remaining opposition, these two approaches and will work for any troubling compulsion that puts on display the general depravity and corruption of our nature. First, you must weaken that sin's indwelling foothold in you that inclines, entices, and compels you to evil, and rebels, opposes, and fights against God by adopting grace in the heart that stands in opposition to sin and destructive of sin, giving it a home and habitual residence there. So, 
Pride is weakened by the implanting and growth of humility. And passion is weakened by patience and cleanness by purity of mind. In conscience, love of this world by heavenly mindedness. The Holy Spirit acts with various forms of grace, just like our old natural corruption acts with various forms of sinful desire. Second, we must promptly, eagerly, cheerfully fight against sin, using all the ways, means, and aims described here. Success largely depends on these two things. Through these efforts, if the sin does not have some unconquerable advantage, because a man is naturally bent toward that desire, he may possibly gain so much of a conquest over it that his soul may never again feel opposition from it, finally allowing him to enjoy peace in his conscience to match the true meaning of the covenant of grace.